Today, I want to preach about a very unfamiliar, familiar passage from the book of Psalm, the 23rd number of Psalm. I want to preach from the Hebrew word, Yahavah Rohim. Yahava Rohi. Today, if you don't know Hebrew, you will learn a little bit. Yah or Jah or Jehovah is a covenant name of God. So whenever you hear Jah or Yah, that's a covenant name. As a matter of fact, Yahweh is the fool, but a Jew will never call that. And instead of the YWHY, which is Yahweh, the pronunciation in Hebrew is the Yahavah. But Yahavah has a pronoun added to it. Let me teach you. Yahava represent Rohi is shepherd. Yahava did not just mean God or the Lord or the owner. The Va at the end of it personalized it. So David say, Yahavah or my God. There's a difference between my God and the God. David said, the God I want to talk to you about is my God, Yahavah. Yahavah Rohim. Uh, this brings us to a unique relationship that David has with God that transcend even his own time. David was so much in personal relationship with God until God in the book of Acts said that I will reestablish the Leviticus priesthood because of these personal relationship that he has with God so from dispensation after dispensation God always take us back to this relationship that he has with David that makes David not just say Yah Rohim but he say Yahavah Rohim it's not just God the shepherd it is my God, the shepherd. The depth of the relationship that David has with God transcends any part of human transgression or human fault that we see that was so common with David. So God say, because of my personal relationship, I, you know, I know him at a level of a friend. I know him at a deeper level. So don't you plant your seed on other people's rain. Because you don't know the relationship they had with God. So David has that personal, interpersonal relationship with God that you may see David do some stuff, but you don't know the extent of the interpersonal relationship that David has with God. And I want you to know that no human flaws 
can negate our relationship with a divine God. So what you need to do is to establish your relationship with God. So God say, I will establish again the Leviticus tabernacle. We have selfishly looked at Psalm 23. Let's read it. Uh, the Lord, everybody shout the Lord. Come and shout the Lord. The Lord is just Yah or Jah. But when David say, is my shepherd, he make it Yahavah. He make it personal. So I don't care who is around. I don't care what your pedigree is. I don't care what your name is. When it comes to relationship with God, he is not just Yah. Is Yahavah, and because of that, I shall not want. Now, we have selfishly mis no, I, I won't call it misinterpretation because it means that too. We, but we have selfishly thought that this scripture is only. I didn't say it's not, but it is only for the ability of God to provide. Because we see that he said, I shall not want. We have taken it that God is going to provide for me. He is my shepherd. He will provide. He will take care of me. That's the limit of our exposition of this text. But today, I want to take you to the next verse. What did he say in the next verse? He maketh me. Hold it. I want to center now on the make it today. On the fact that he make it. Making me to lie down is not necessarily just telling me he has provision for me. And we stop at the provision. But we did not follow through. He make it me to lie down. He make it me to lie down. I don't care if it's green or it's not green. It make it me to lie down. It may not even be a purple pasture. It make it me to lie down. It may be in a project. It make it me to lie down. It may be on a job that is endless. It make it me to lie down. Oh, you will see something in this that is beyond everything that you have ever thought god is my provider is yes he's your provider i'm not denying that but it's bigger than that he maketh me to lie down yahava ruhi yahava ruhi we have failed to recognize the possibilities that this text might be demanding something of us before we enjoy the utopia of verse 1. Before we enjoy the utopia of I shall not want or I shall not have a need, we might have forgotten that there is a demand on us according to this text so we are looking at the payoff but we are not examining the work we have to put in so today let's dig into what this text is pointing to us the reason why i should not have a want or a need is because of what transpired let me expound on a principle. Entrance. I'm taking you somewhere. Hang with me. Entrance into a new season demand exit from an old season. Before we can attain a new door. We have to exit from the old door. 
we have to end one issue before we can begin another issue. Ending is not always pleasant, but most of the time necessary. We don't like to end, especially the things that we like. But until you end it, you cannot end enter into it i'm coming for you so god will cause us to end something before we can begin i cannot say hello to our new things unless i'm prepared to say goodbye to an old things and therefore now the quality of the life we enjoy is not necessarily begin with what we say hello to but it begins with what we say goodbye to Yahweh Ruhim new things and this will blow you up new things even new problem is sometimes welcome because none of us like problem but i don't like the same problem you know none of us really like problem but the same problem and the same problem you know that is only telling me that i have not learned from the problem to make correction to the problem so if i'm going to have problem let it be something new no, no, no. I'm not saying you're going to have problems, but let it be something new. However, we have to understand that what we know is in the past. Where we are going is in the future. And we will never get to where we are going until we let go of what we know. Because we have a date with destiny. I'm coming to you. We have a date with destiny. God made this so clear to us when he penned through one of his prophets by the name of Jeremiah. And he told Jeremiah, he said, now listen, Jeremiah, I know the plan that I have for you. And the plan that I have for you demand for you to say alias to your past. You have to be able to say bonjour to your future, but until you say goodbye, au revoir to your, to your past. So, work with me on this. I know the plan. I know the plan that Talk to me. I, everybody say I, I, have for you. Wait a minute. God was talking to Jeremiah. But he did not say, I know the plan. No, he did not say, Jeremiah knows the plan. No, y'all didn't get it here. I'm going to try this side. I got Jeremiah here. God said, I know the plan, not Jeremiah. Yes. All right, let's go, go here now. It means that God got some stuff planned for you and he didn't let you in on it. I am the one who knows the plan. And I'm not even going to tell you. I hold that secret to me. But I'm going to give you a peep window. For you to know that the plan is good. And if you follow the plan, it will take you to your expected end. Tell your neighbor you got a date with destiny. <laughs> Yahweh Rohim. 
Oh, you, you, you're going to get there. I'm, I'm working you. Uh, it means we have been used to control the situation. If you want to be a doctor, you go to college so you can become a doctor. If you want money, you work so you can have money. You want a house, you save. We have been in control. But the law say, ready for this. He say, work. But you ain't got no choice whether you're going to get a house or not. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to tell you today is you are not in control. Tell your neighbor you are not in control. In order for you to enter into this new calling of the Lord, you have to say goodbye to control and hello to dependency. So David, after he grew up, he came to an understanding that finally, I thought I knew it. I was anointed three times. I was anointed at the age of 17. I did not get to be a king until the age of 30. In between, I was anointed by the elders of Israel. I was anointed three times, but I never understand that all God is trying to show me in this text is that I have to give up control. Yahavah, Rohim. The Lord is my shepherd. He's not talking only about the provision. He's talking about the Lord, which means the owner, the controller, the one that is in charge. That's all he's talking about. He's telling you, I am in control. You are not in control. We have to say goodbye to control. So, saints, I'm sorry. Today is not a milk day. Today is uh, the tough neck bone that you can almost crack your teeth trying to get to the meat. It's not a milk day. So I'm sorry for those of you who are still on the bottle. You're going to grow up fast. Because you have been raised to control your destiny. But now you have to say goodbye to your control. And give it all to God. Because Yahavah is the controller. My God is the controller. He's the one that is going to take you to where you have to be. When David made the declaration that the Lord is my shepherd, he is saying, I see God as more than just a savior. I see God that's more than just the one who saved my life. I see him as the one who leads my life. I see God as more than just the one who cleaned my past. I see him as the one who guides my future. I see God as more than the one who handled my mistakes. But I see him as him who ordered my step. Yahavah. Ruhim. He is no longer in control, but he finally recognized that he has to give up the control, something he needed to give up that sometimes he would rather keep. I come to talk to some of us 
whom God is telling you what you need to give up. And that thing are things that you rather keep. Oh my God. He must give up control. But let's look at control. Is control really a control? Do you really control anything? Can control therefore be an illusion? Do you think control is real? Okay, let me sh show this to you. You can control how you drive. But you cannot control how other folks drive. So, if you think you're going to control yourself so that you don't have an accident, you can drive as good as you can. Not in the front, but at the back you're not even looking at somebody hit you. So, is control really real? Or an illusion. You can control how you fill out the application. How you dress for the interview. But can you control whether you get higher? You can control how you make the offer. And how you fashion your offer. But can you control how you, whether it will be accepted? You can control how you speak. But can you control how it is received? So could what we thought to be control, really a control, but an illusion. David got up to this point and he says, this very thing I've been holding on to and don't want to release. That I want to control my outcome. Could it be nothing but just an illusion? Because <laughs> I got something for you on control. We contribute, but we do not control. We influence, but we do not determine the outcome. You can put in your two cents worth. But the result is left to God. Yahavah. When we attempt to control the outcome, we are putting ourselves in a place to bear the weight that we are not designed for. When we are attempting to control the outcome, we are bearing a something that theologians declare to be called the God weight. Oh, let me explain it. There is a weight for outcome. And we are not built for that weight. God designed us to bear the weight of contribution. But we were never designed to bear the weight of outcome. Every time we place ourselves in a position to try to control the outcome, we get under the load that is called God's load. And that load will crush us because our shoulders are not broad enough to carry the weight of God. Our stamina is not strong enough to carry God's weight. So when we move from our place of contribution into an attempt to control the result, 
we have the big issue of what is called the weight of glory. Because the outcome is the glory of the process. And God said, my glory I will share with no man. So anytime you are trying to get under the control of the outcome, you will find yourself under the rock that if you stand on it, it will bear you. But if he set on you, he's going to crush you. Because God is the only one who takes the glory for the result of what comes in your life. Little do you know when you were in high school that you will be whom you are today. September 14, 1978, as I stepped my foot for the first time in Washington, D.C., all I could do was contribute into the future and the destiny that God did not share with me. I never knew I would be a bishop in 2020, but I contributed myself into the process that God already know the plan. He said before the foundation of the world, I already come and tell your neighbor you are a work in progress. Only God can control the outcome. It's only God that can speak to the wind and the wind will lay down. It takes only a God to speak to the thunder and the thunder will put on emergency brake. Only God can control the outcome. David said, as much as I have tried, I found out that Yahweh Rohim, it is God that controls. Therefore, we are stressed, tired, pulled apart because we try to go under a weight that is not designed for us. Every time you are frustrated, you need to ask yourself the question, why am I frustrated? Am I frustrated because I am trying to do to carry a God weight because he will never put more on you than you can bear. So every time you are sensing more is getting on you, could that be your signal that you are stepping into the arena that is only designed for the Elohim? Yahweh. Rohim. Psalm 23. The beauty of this psalm is not who wrote it. We know David wrote it. The beauty of this psalm is not where it was placed. We know it was placed between Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. So the beauty is not because it's, oh, okay, let me, let me deal with that. You know, it's placed in, some, in between Psalm 22 and 24 for a reason. You know, but that's not the beauty of it. You know, that, yeah, uh, well, you, you, you will not agree. Well, in Psalm 22, that is a mountain called Calvary. That's where Jesus cried. Eli, Eli. Lama Sabatani, my God, my God. Why does it look like I lost control? Why have you forsaken me? Means I lost control. That's Psalm 22. Oh, I got you. Psalm 24 is the place where you say, Lift up your heads, O ye gaze. 
and be ye lifted up, O ye everlasting door. Gates, lift up your own head, give up control. <laughs> everlasting door. Everlasting means it doesn't keep up, it doesn't give up. So you will be lifted up. Even doors give up control. So in Psalm 22, control is lost. In Psalm 24, control is lost. And David smacked dead in the middle in Psalm 23 and say, He maketh me. Yahweh. Rohim. But that's not the beauty. I, I don't even know. That's not the beauty of this text. It's not the fact that David wrote it. It's not the fact where it is placed. But the beauty of this text is something simple. The beauty of this text that attracted me to this text is the fact that when he wrote it, David wrote this text after he sat down, after he has made the king 17 years in the waiting i mean 13 years in the waiting and he finally made it to the throne and when he get to the throne he rub his head and say fine to do oh i listen in no sharing whatsoever your hand find to do just do it work in Jesse's house. David, this is what blew my mind. You are not struggling to be a king now. You have attained. And this is the time he penned this song. When he has arrived, he penned the song. He said, Yahavarohim, my God. All along. But what drove him there? This is what drove him there. What drove him there was that he remembered that he was anointed as king, but he was number one shoveling sheep dunk. And he never quit. Number two, he got promoted as a sheep dunk shover. And he got promoted to a piece of delivery boy. No, y'all don't read your Bible like I read mine. When Jesse told him to go and take food to the brothers in the war front, what Jesse gave him was bread and cheese. That's pizza. That's pizza. A king with his royal diadem, 13 years of anointing. And he was reduced to a piece of delivery board. But David, this is why I say, this is what attracted me to this psalm. David wrote it after a reminiscing, the reminiscing on, on the fact that I never control the outcome when I was going to deliver pizza to my brothers and because I was just contributing to the process I if drop in the discussion of the ROTC I was not in the military but I heard two things I heard a no good giant that was parading in the valley and talking blasphemy against the God of Israel. I heard it. Number two, I heard that the king has thrown in the tower. The Bible said the army of Israel was in array. And that of the Philistine was in array. 
to those of you who don't understand military term, array means we will not kill a thousand people on this side to win the battle. And you will not kill a thousand here to win the battle. That's mono to mono. But what we will do is take a representative. And if your giant defeat our representative, then all of us become your slave. And there was nobody in Israel, not even David's big tall brothers that Samuel wanted to anoint first. But when the pizza boy got there, he heard that. Tell your neighbor, don't control the outcome. Look at what God did. God allowed what huh, Goliath say instigated a holy insubordination in the spirit of David. Other soldiers have heard it, but when David heard it, there is an holy indignation. That's rose up in the spirit of David. And he said, say what? Y'all listen to that? And every soldier was walking like this. Have you ever walked in here? And saw what the devil is raising havoc on God's people. And say, I don't care if I have no title. I don't care if I have no name, but this which I hear, I'm taking a warfare. Have you fasted a whole day by yourself saying, no way will I go back to that church and see another woman suffer like she suffered? Have you ever been determined that every unemployed person that the enemy is robbing. I am going to break this thing. Have you have holy indignation? David had one. But watch this. And as David heard it. Somebody made a mistake. And said David. <laughs> the king is going to give you his daughter for wife. And David said oh, oh well. I ain't married yet, but that's no big deal. And the other one say, hey, you ain't going to never pay taxes. He said, say what? No taxes? For killing that Goliath? I mean. Everybody shout, I mean. Why do I bring that up? I brought that up that God will send a nonchalant message to instigate something in you. How much tax would David pay? But that no tax is, that's all it takes. He said, I'm ready. Let's go for it. And Saul took his coat of armor and placed it on David. Watch this now. David took on the coat and step one or two times. I can't move like I want to move. <laughs> the Bible say David is a corny musician. That is, the boy is fast. But you weigh him down. What did I tell you? Every time you try to control the outcome, you carry the weight that is too big for you. The coat of Saul is to control the outcome. And that was too big for David. And David said, take this off. Because I'm fast without that. They said, this man He's going to kill you. He's going to crush you. If he can't catch me. 
When you put this coat on me, you go slow me down. But if you let me operate within the anointing in my life, if I try to be you, I will be nothing but the artificial you. But when I become me, I become my original self. Let me be who God has made me. God. So David put off the coat. And when he put off the coat, he got in the array. <laughs> Goliath! Hey! 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 The man is about 10 feet tall. He's got six fingers on each hand. When he breathed, his breath sounds like a rusty gate. His nose can swallow a bucket of a five gallon bucket at one time. He is superhuman. David, you're going to match up with. But there's something called a sling. Everybody shout a sling. I come to tell those of you who cannot touch it. I come to preach to those of you who cannot handle it. That God got a weapon for you called a sling. Goliath. What is the meaning of Goliath? Maybe the reason why we are trying to have control is because we don't know the meaning of Goliath. The word Goliath means uncover. It means reveal. Could it be that God has some problems that are waiting in your pathway that look like an obstacle but they are not problems but they are opportunity to reveal what is in you. Put in the process let God control the outcome. God has designed a Goliath to reveal an anointed king for 13 years that was never revealed. A king, a leader, a powerhouse, but just waiting for God's designed Goliath. The boss on the job that you are complaining about may be a Goliath that is going to reveal what God put in you. The spouse that look like a headache may be a Goliath to reveal the temperance that God put in you. Cool your way to the top. Be through your Goliath. Cool your way to the palace. If David did not go to deliver pizza, he will have never met a Goliath. He will still be in the field feeding the sheep. When you stayed in Jesse's house and allow God to peel the onion by the layers to unveil, uncover what he put in you in Jeremiah 
29. I know the plan that I had for you. All the time it looked like your daddy ignore you. I won't even bring you out when Samuel came and it looked like you are an abused child. I did that because I know the plan. All the time you were ostracized and jumped over with promotion and given it to somebody else who has different color. I know the plan. The moment you try to control the outcome, you lose it. Contribute to the process. Because Yahweh Rohim. Finally, God say, If I be your shepherd, let me lead you. <laughs> you need to be like Gideon. That takes me as Jehovah. And let me show you that I'm Shalom. You need to be like Abraham. That takes me as Jehovah. Then I need to be your Jireh. You need to be like David. That takes me as Jehovah. Then you need to let me be your Ruhi. If I am your savior, let me save you. If I am food, let me feed you. If I am water, let me quench your thirst. If I am a savior, let me save your life. If I am power, let me rescue you. If I am a healer, let me deliver you. Yahweh Rohim he left a space for Moses when Moses said what is your name how do I present you he said I am that I am I am the mysterious tetragram that you can only add whatever you want in this space the tetragramic power revel, revelation of God let us know that we don't have to worry about the outcome because when we get to the gate of the outcome he's going to be I am that I am whatever the outcome you need when you get to Egypt I'm going to be like that when you get to the king, you can speak. Don't worry, I'm going to be your voice. When you get to the wilderness and the water tastes, don't worry, I'm going to be sweet enough for the waters of matter. When the snake bites you, don't worry, just I am. That I am. Stand to your feet. Thank you for watching. I'm sure you were richly blessed by this message. For more life-changing messages from Bishop Wesley Arije, visit us on social media. To know more about Pavilion of Hope, please visit our website at www.pavilionofhope.net or join us as a special guest for our transformation service every Sunday at any of our locations closest to you. Pavilion of Hope, where faith is renewed and hope is restored.